afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us as we discuss financial planning priorities for Americans in the Netherlands and Germany. We'll be having a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the presentation, so please feel free to ask any questions in the Q&A window, which you can access at the foot of your screen as and when you think of them, and we'll do our best to answer them um, after the presentation. Just before we dive in, uh, let's just give a quick disclaimer. The information presented in this webinar is for educational purposes only and does not intend to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments or investment strategies. Investments involve risk and unless otherwise stated are not guaranteed. Please be sure to first consult with a qualified financial advisor and or tax professional for implementing any of the strategies discussed. That being done, let's meet our panelists. Um, today we have David Bellingham, the CEO and Director of Black Swan Capital. He's been advising international clients and heading up financial services businesses across three continents for over 20 years. We also have Ed Mannering Burton, who is Director of Advice and General Manager for the Netherlands, Belgium and Germany for Black Swan Capital. Ed is an international, internationally experienced financial advisor with more than a decade's experience across Dubai, Switzerland and the Netherlands. Brian Dunhill is the founder of Dunhill Financial and, financial and a financial planner with a core cool emphasis on concentrated positions and retirement planning for expats. So without further ado, let me hand over to our panelists. Thank you very much, Hugo, and good afternoon, guys. How are you doing today? Wonderful. Thanks for having us. Good. Thank you for having us. It's, uh, it's good to be speaking with you all today. Uh, we're talking around uh, about Americans and the complexities you have as US connected individuals living in the in Germany and the Netherlands and Ed and I will cover some some key topics around that uh, some of the key factors and issues that we see and that our clients ask us about uh, before getting into some of the questions that uh, that you have for us uh, so Ed, shall we talk a bit about uh, some of those key principles um, that we see around being compliant things we should and shouldn't do and uh, and go from there Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, let, let's start off with the, a couple of the, the big pitfalls that we see quite often when we're speaking with US connected individuals. Um, now, first of all, there's this, this horrible term of US connected. And uh, what does that really mean in essence? Now, of course, if you were born in the States, if you have a US passport, if you are a citizen of the United States of America, you know full well that you are an American, that you have a duty uh, to pay taxes to the IRS, you have to report every year, but you then might be passing on that liability to uh, to other people in your in your sphere of influence, let's say. So uh, if, uh, if you're married to somebody who's not an American, then they become what's, uh, what's known as a US connected individual, otherwise called an accidental American, which means that they might not have a liability to the IRS, but they still have to report annually and they have to make sure that their assets are US compliant. Now, this is a, a big problem that we see very often where people simply don't realize that they, their assets need to be US compliant. And so uh, quite often people will find out that they've been doing things the wrong way for years. And that can be quite costly when you then come to start being compliant and, uh, and adjust it. But that is much, much better than the alternative, which is, of course, being found out and, uh, and the IRS or the SEC deciding that you were trying to do something wrong on purpose, which 99.9% .9 of the cases is not what the actual story was. Now, a lot of people, once they do realize that they need all of their assets to be compliant with US regulations, think that they might have some kind of loophole. Now, uh, the most common one that we come across is people saying, well, I'm just going to use my parents' address or my old address in the States or a forwarding address. My, my friend Joe uh, has said that I can have mail delivered to their house and then, uh, and then they will forward it. So the bank, the financial institution, the pension company believes that I'm living there. Now, of course, that's just lying. And of course, we all know that if you're lying to a financial institution, let alone lying to the tax authorities, you could be in a world of trouble. So if you're ever tempted to try and seek one of these workarounds or loopholes, just understand a loophole 
in the terminology of uh, financial services and financial regulation is just breaking the law. So do not do it. If you do have old accounts, uh, old portfolios that you've got registered to an address in the states that you don't live at, you must update those and let them know that you're now living in Europe. It may be that all they need to do is change the data on the page and uh, and you'll simply have your, your mail forwarded to your new address in Netherlands or Germany. Uh, or it may be that you need to close that account because it's not suitable for overseas investors. Isn't that right, David? Yeah, it's exactly right. And that, that's the fair point too at the end there where there are a couple of paths that they can take, but you do need to be compliant like that. We hear this, this quite a lot. Um, uh, one of the factors being that, you know, in a practical sense, that institution will be reporting you back to the IRS every year. If you're submitting your tax returns here as a, as a resident in Europe, back to the US, so you're a non-resident American, doing it in a compliant manner, and the institution is reporting you as an onshore resident, there's a conflict there, quite clearly. And so there's a, an inconsistency. So that's a, a practical way in which it could be picked up. But uh, you're best getting ahead of that so you don't have those problems. So uh, whilst it's, you think it could cause complications, we do recommend you do that. The other thing that we hear, which is probably even a little more extreme, is having someone invest on your behalf. It's never a good idea to do that at all in any context. But certainly in this case, having someone do that on your behalf creates a whole lot of other problems around, for them, potential tax liabilities as well for you in terms of rights to those assets in the future. Uh, so there are simple ways to get around these supposed hurdles about being US connected. But the things you should not do are uh, using someone else's address, having someone uh, invest in your behalf, or or just claiming it's all too hard and ignoring the problem until it's brought up for you, which is a third solution that, that people will put forward to us. That I'll just wait till someone contacts me. Invariably, if they do, it's, it's going to be um, a more difficult situation to resolve than if you are proactively address it. Yeah, I think that's that's a very important point that there's always going to be this uh, this fear of the situation when you realise that it's not quite so easy for you to invest as an American overseas compared to how your your friends, your colleagues, your neighbours over here. Are investing then there's the temptation to sort of bury your head in the sand and think well do i even need to do anything why not just keep it all in the bank now it seems very difficult to look at it from the outside and you see these uh, these hurdles and all of these scary acronyms like you're, you're hearing fbar and fatca banded about and and quite often people don't really understand what these acronyms refer to or what they mean it's very easy to just look at this whole situation and think, right, OK, I'm going to leave it. I'm going to ignore it. I've got my pensions and I've got my house and that's it. That's OK. In reality, it's actually very straightforward that um, if we were having this conversation 10 or 15 years ago, it, it might have been very, very difficult for Americans overseas to actually find any institution that would accept them as an investor. These days, there are more and more institutions that understand this is a service that needs to be provided. And so the only thing that we have to make sure of is if there's a US connection involved, if you have a liability to the IRS, then any solution that we present to you, any kind of investment that we structure for you must say at the top of the page, it's designed for US investors. Now, if it's not specifically designed with US connected investors in mind, avoid it. It's simply not worth the risk. But yeah. if it says across the top of the page, it's designed for US international investors, absolutely fine. And you'll find that you'll be able to invest much as you would be able to back home in the States or much as your, your friends and colleagues would be able to if they're not US connected here. It's just a very slightly different structure with slightly different reporting regulations for it. And, and, and contrary to what a, a lot of things you'll hear, are, you'll hear, it doesn't mean you have to forego liquidity and flexibility, that is access to your money. So uh, you do maintain that flexibility, you can maintain that liquidity, that is access to your money, changing if your circumstances change uh, without any restriction relative to, to any other non-US connected investor or if you are in the US.
when we're looking at this though, it's it's worth taking a step back. Because a lot of people will come to us as a US connected person and say, no one will touch me. I can't get my money anywhere. I can open a bank account. But when it comes to investing, I can't do anything. I just need somewhere to put the money. So we we often uh, ask for pause at that point and take a, a step and treat it as if you didn't have the restrictions of being US connected or if you were back in the US and bring it back to what you're trying to achieve. After all, investments are a means to an end. And it's the end goal that you're, you, sh you should be focusing on. So we bring you back to your objectives. And whether you're here in the Netherlands or Germany and, and juggling the, the complexities of those countries plus the, the US passport, you still need to look at the, the core reasons why you're investing and what you're trying to achieve. And I think these are, whilst they're applicable for everybody, it's I think it's particularly cogent if you're US connected to, to remind yourself of this. So think about what you're trying to achieve. Uh, what are your goals? Is it retirement? If so, at what age? And where? Because we can't presume, and we hear this every day, that, well, the most common response to the question, where are you going to retire, is I don't know. Uh, it's rarely Netherlands or Germany, often. It's, it's somewhere where the sun shines a little more. Uh, but it could be back in the US. It could be elsewhere in Europe. It could be, it could be anywhere. So you need to factor these things in and add flexibility where where required when you're retiring is really important because that's the trigger point at which you'll be starting to from this asset potentially uh, what other retirement assets do you have here or in the us or both uh, and what other goals do you have is it important to leave assets to your to your children is it intergenerational wealth transfer do you want to erode and amortize that that asset over through retirement are there other goals do you want to buy a new house do you want to buy a boat and sail around the world uh, any other dreams and, and aspirations you may have, they're the things that will drive your investment goals. That's where we start. And then we get into to US compliance and starting to to juggle all those uh, acronyms and other restrictions that you have. I think that's, that's a very good point to bring up there, David, that um, retirement to a lot of people around the world is this, this very sort of alien concept that certainly if you ask most 18 to 25 year olds about retirement they would give you some answer along the lines of well uh, that's that's years off i haven't even thought about that but um generally people think more about retirement the closer they get to it but what a lot of people don't consider is what retirement actually means to them and so for a lot of people earlier on in their career certainly the concept of retirement is uh, sitting on a, in a rocking chair on the front porch with a cup of hot chocolate and uh, shouting at pigeons. When in reality, when somebody reaches the age of 60 or 65 or even 70 these days, we're far more active than we used to be. And so it's not unusual for somebody to, to finish their working life and decide that they're going to retire and then take up skydiving or uh, or wakeboarding or decide that they want to be the first person to to snowboard down the 10 tallest mountains on the planet and whatever retirement is to you that's what you should be building towards in your long-term investments but if we look at retirement not as being forced to stop work but as the day when your alarm goes off in the morning and you wake up and you can choose what you're going to do. So you don't have to go to work because you don't need that income. You, you can choose whether you're going to visit family members or uh, go skydiving or jet off on a holiday at the last minute or maybe do some work. But it's your choice. And that, for me, is retirement. It's having that option. And so whatever your targets are, whether you've decided that uh, that you want to be able to retire at 50 rather than at 59 and a half when your US pensions might become available or 66 when your, your Dutch or German pensions might become available, you've decided that you want to retire at 50. What does that mean in reality? What do you need in order to have that choice every day as to what you're going to do? What do you need financially? What do you need socially what do you need in terms of uh, accommodation and think of all of these things in order to build your target and equally if your target is that you want to be able to financially provide for your kids think more about what does that mean 
do you, do you need to be able to provide them with uh, the tuition fees for university or even for international school before that, maybe a deposit to buy a house, to start up a business? All of these things, we can put a number on them and we can put a timescale on them. And that gives us the best possible opportunity to build a structure and a strategy for you that will give us, give us the best chance of reaching that target over time. But ultimately, it's about first identifying what those goals are and then quantifying them, putting, putting them into tangible terms so that we can set a target based on your personal financial goals. That's right. And one of the interesting overlays that we see with internationals, if you like, people that live in different countries, as opposed to someone who stayed in their home country all their life, is that you're generating wealth, uh, whether that's through pension assets, social security or other, in probably a different manner. Uh, on the downside risk, if you've jumped around countries, you may find yourself with a pension gap. That is a period of time when you weren't accumulating pensions or you're accumulating them in different systems and potentially at different rates. So it's important to work this out. You know, Have I spent five years working in a country where I'm not accruing any pension? Uh, what happens to the investments or the pensions I'm accruing in countries I'm living now? And we might talk for a few minutes, perhaps, Ed, about um, Dutch and German pension systems, just at an overall level, how you accrue those, because uh, it is different uh, and how they may apply. There, certainly, there's an age difference, and that's that's one thing you touched on. Uh, the AOV, which is the state pension here in the Netherlands, uh, to which you accrue, generally, it's 2% of the total payment for every year that you're living here. The total payment is 70% of the minimum wage. So you work here for 50 years, and that's what you get um, as the, the base state pension. So you can work that out if you're here for 15 years, 30%, uh, and so forth. But you may not be here when you're claiming it. Uh, you may be back in the US or elsewhere, and, and presuming you can still claim that. You may have currency risk and other factors to to to, uh, to take into account. But you're also going to be older because the current age that you can access Dutch pension is 67, but heading up to age 70, depending on your date of birth. So it's going to be perhaps a bit later than what you might access a, a US social security or certainly your other pensions there. Uh, there are some, uh, some other fundamental differences as well with a, a Dutch employer pension, for example, or even a personal one. It may well be that you don't have access to the capital, unlike a, a US pension, where um, you can potentially access some of that capital and make that home improvement by the, the motorboat or whatever it is you want to buy. Um, here you get, uh, in, in the Netherlands, you get access to the capital only to acquire an annuity, that is an income stream. That's great because that's what pensions are supposed to do, and that's the security of income or a portion of for the rest of your life and potentially your spouse's life as well. But it doesn't give you that flexibility necessarily to, to go and draw down a lump sum to, to go around the world. So there, there are different aspects you need to consider, which is different from just accruing all your asset in your home country. And I think that's important to consider. Uh, having mentioned that, the, the German system is more complex again, isn't it, than I think than the, uh, than the Dutch one? because there are different types of pensions. Well, yeah, as, as with anything, I wouldn't say more complex, but certainly different. That um, You do still have the, the elements that, um, that are fairly common throughout most pension systems around the world. So uh, the World Economic Forum uh, encourages what's called a three-pillar pension system. And uh, the, the Dutch system is absolutely formed around these three pillars where you have social security as your first pillar, you then have your employment pension as your second pillar, and you have a private pension as your third pillar. Now, in all of those cases, there's a minimum and a maximum level according to how much can be tax relieved. And if we compare that to the US system, you've got your US social security, you've then got your, your 401k employment pension, and you then have a traditional IRA or Roth IRAs, uh, so traditional IRA and Roth IRAs as your self-invested aspect. So there are still, in a way, those three pillars. Now, the German system works in a very similar way that you have the, the social security that everybody contributes to, and you then have your employment pension and the option for an additional pension that you can contribute to privately. The, the naming is slightly different, that you have the Basis Renta, the Riester Renta, and the Privat Renta, and not all of them 
in the Dutch system and in the German system are suitable for US connected investors. This is a very important consideration. Um, because they are insurance linked investments, because they're in, in German terms, pension insurances, then, and in Dutch terms, there is a life component to those investments, then they may not be US compliant. So you need to be very careful that you're not putting money into something that, uh, that is not getting you the full benefit with the restrictions. In any investment, we, uh, we sometimes talk about what's called the gas principle. And so it's the, the trade-off you have between growth, access, and security in any type of asset or any type of uh, part of your financial life. The way I like to think about this is um, like the, the coffee pot that you get at a hotel breakfast. Now, every one of us who's ever stayed in a hotel has and sat down for breakfast in the morning has seen one of these little coffee or teapots. There's always exactly enough in that little pot for two cups of coffee. So you imagine you've got three coffee cups on your table in the morning, one marked G for growth, one marked A for access, one marked S for security. Now, you've only got two cups of coffee in your pot, so you can fill two of them right up to the brim, but then the other one has nothing in it. So if you want maximum growth and maximum access, you have no security whatsoever. And so you have to blend this and, uh, and offset them against each other. You sacrifice one in, term, uh, in, in order to benefit from one of the others. Now, with a pension, we get tax deferral, which increases the growth, but, and we get a lot of security built into it, but we trade that off against the access. So by putting your money into a pension, you're getting that tax deferral or tax credit on the contributions. You're getting maximum opportunity for growth of your investments within the policy. And you're getting the maximum possible security because pensions are normally guaranteed by the state in some way. But you don't have access until the state says this is when you can access it. So uh, your national retirement age or the designated retirement age when you start the pension scheme will be the earliest you can get that. Now, if for some reason you do want to access some of that early, uh, earlier than the standard retirement age, if you have that facility, then it will always be at a trade-off. You might have to pay a higher level of tax, so you're sacrificing some of that growth. Now, in all of these schemes, we have to take other factors into account. With the, with the German system, the amount you can contribute to your pensions and the amount that's tax deferred in particular, is very closely related to what your earnings are at the time. In the Dutch system, you might be under the 30% ruling, uh, which means that you have, first of all, exemption from, uh, from the box three tax, the, the tax on income from investments, and also partial exemption from income tax for five years. And so if you're getting these tax deferrals, uh, these tax reductions and mitigations already, is the tax deferral from over contributing to the pension system actually giving you all the benefit it could? Now, then if you have additionally pensions in the US, we have to think about the restrictions that are applied there. Now, something that I often say to clients is that you should save in the currency you're planning to spend. If you never plan to return to the States, is it really a good idea for you to be collecting a lot of US dollars? If you're dead set on retirement in Japan, should you really be building up dollars, pounds, and euros? So we need to look at, again, these objectives to identify what we're building towards and what we will need on that day. Now, when it comes to your pensions, this becomes very relevant with the ones that you've left behind. Clearly, if you've worked in one of the 27 countries in the EU and then moved to another, it doesn't make a difference. To, for most of those countries, you would be using the, the euro, you would be saving in that currency, and you can transport those pensions from one, currency, uh, one country to the other. If you've got pensions in the States and you've moved over to Europe and you plan on staying here long term, you have to think carefully about whether those pensions are going to serve your needs when you do come to retire. Firstly, every 401k pension that I've ever come across will insist on paying out in US dollars. Uh, the majority of ones that I have uh, I've 
come across will want that money to be paid to a US domestic bank account. And I've even come across some that will only pay it out by check. Now, if you can imagine going to your branch of Deutsche Bank or ABN AMRO with a US dollar check from your 401k provider, they would laugh you out of the building. It's, uh, it's simply not something that they would be able to deal with. And if they could, it would be expensive and slow. So that's not necessarily something that you want to be uh, you want to be dealing with an extra hassle in your retirement. So there are possibilities uh, to do something called a 401k rollover, where you translate the 401k into an IRA. It, it's not suitable for everybody, but it might give you more freedom to, to have that money paid to an international bank account or potentially in a different currency. And it might give you a bit more freedom in terms of the underlying investments or the charging structure. So it's something to consider always. And so when it comes to your pensions, first of all, consider are they still aligned with your targets long term in terms of currency, in terms of diversification, in terms of investment strategy, and in terms of the, the ease of use, the flexibility. And secondly, think of whether they are benefiting you in the short term in terms of the contributions that you're making now. Are you getting all the benefit you should be getting for putting money into that pension structure? Or would it perhaps serve you better to have more flexibility, more access, and use a slightly different structure that might not have the, the tax mitigation or the, uh, the, the state yeah. control that a pension structure might? Yeah, that's a good, good point. It some of that falls under the, the banner of just because you can, it doesn't mean you should. Uh, and there are some complexities around some types of US pensions and how they may be considered by tax officers here. And it, it really does require you to get specific advice. So we're gonna keep it really general at this point, but just to say that in Germany and the Netherlands, there has been instances that uh, potentially a Roth IRA may not be considered a pension for tax purposes, just because of issues like time of accessibility to access and tax on withdrawal. What does that mean? That means that if you have a, a Roth rather than a rollover, it might mean that you end up paying capital gains tax in Germany or box share wealth tax in the Netherlands, depending on your situation. So it's, it's certainly a question you need to look into uh, and get advice upon before acting on perhaps making additions to a Roth IRA while you're living in one of those countries. That's completely different from the point that Ed was talking about with rollovers and, um, and 401ks, which may offer great, great potential for you to better manage your assets. David, why don't we uh, why don't we pause for one second and yeah. define what a Roth IRA is before we Go get too it. jargony on uh, Okay, that's on a really good point. Brian, do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, so so essentially in, in America, you have two brackets. We'll, we'll consider one traditionals. Uh, 401ks are, are very similar to these. And then the Roth cycle. Traditional IRAs, you get a salary reduction for making the deposit, but that means after it accumulates in a tax-deferred manner, so you're not paying tax on the growth on an annual basis, uh, when you take the money out, it will be taxed on the U.S. side. On a Roth IRA, it's the opposite. You don't get a tax reduction when you put the money in, but when you take the money out, you would not be taxed, it would come out tax-free. That basically means if you're in the same tax bracket when you're earning your, your money versus when you take the money out, uh, the tax uh, rate will be the same or should be the same, and, and therefore uh, you should end up with the same amount of money. Mm -hmm. So the deciding factor of which you should use if you were only on the U.S. front should be based on what your tax bracket would be at the time of retirement. Um, if you meet David and Edward nice and early, and therefore you'll be living a nice lucrative retirement um, that's in a higher tax bracket, then you would definitely go for the Roth so that you're tax free. Now, this becomes the complex manner of, of planning when you're living abroad. Because as David and Edward pointed out, uh, the Netherlands and Germany are not the most attractive places to take money out uh, of IRAs, traditional or Roth IRAs. So the question should be, should we con continue to contribute on an annual basis to these plans? And the answer comes down to, it depends. 
And if you're going back to the States for sure, um, and you're going to be taking the money out for sure, I would make the suggestion that most times it is actually attractive to continue making those contributions and make sure the money gets into the Roth IRA because you're not getting the tax reduction on the Dutch side. You just need to make sure you're doing your taxes in the right format. So instead of using the foreign earned income exclusion, which basically states, I'm going to check a box stating that I make under a certain amount of money, and therefore I don't owe any U.S. tax, we're going to have to take the credit system where we're basically stating, I paid this much German tax, which is most likely more than what you would owe in the U.S., and therefore I'm subtracting that from my U.S. taxes, and I can make an IRA contribution, and I can even backdoor it into the Roth IRA right away. We have a full video of, of that entire process on our YouTube channel, um, so I don't have to go too in-depth on that, but if you need help finding that or have any questions on it, we're more than happy to help on this. If you don't know where you're going to retire, that becomes the question of where should I contribute first so that I can actually accomplish each of the different goals, i.e. if you've maxed out your contributions in each of the different places, it won't be harmful. But if you haven't, you're going to want to talk to David and Edward about where should I contribute first to optimize my overall taxes from that vantage point. That was a long, a long uh, answer to a short question. Sorry, David. <laughs> That's really good, Brian. Thank you. Really helpful. That, I think, gives us a, a good overall picture. And perhaps it's a good point to just pause and reflect on what we've talked about so far, because we're covering a lot of ground. Um, we've talked about what makes someone U.S. connected if you're not a U.S. citizen and you're on this call, or if you are and you have members of your influence as their children, are they, are they impacted or not, and how are they impacted? So we've talked about who is a, a U.S. connected or accidental American, and some of the restrictions that, that are in this acronym heavy area, like, a, like the, the FACA and FBAR reporting, and the restrictions of, of staying compliant to that. Um, overriding that, though, we, we did mention that if, when you are planning, you need to plan from your core principles, the key objectives that are important to you anyway. And I think that that applies to looking forward. And one of the questions we often get is, uh, what are the financial planning priorities in, in 2023? What are the priorities this year? And what should we be focusing on? Uh, in a sense, it's, it's, it's timeless because you're, the priorities are your goals and your objectives. What changes over time is the timeline and the, the economic uh, environment around us will ebb and flow through its cycles. But the principles, I think, do remain consistent and the same uh, in whatever environment we're in. Focusing on the long term is one of our principles and avoiding what is happening in the immediate term, today and tomorrow, um, and what, and then certainly avoiding what is the next hot thing. I think that's uh, an important lesson that we we convey to all of our clients and focus on how do you get to your objectives and your goals with the lowest possible risk. That's absolutely right. And um, there's always always the temptation with investment to to do what's worked for other people. And uh, we always try to impress on all of our clients the importance of of understanding your individual needs and understanding that you are an individual and that what has already worked for some other people i'm afraid you might have missed that boat that uh for example if um, if your parents were to to ask their parents for investment advice then their parents would definitely say heavy industry um motor car manufacturers that sort of thing if uh, if we were to ask our parents for investment advice, they would undoubtedly say real estate, bricks and mortar. Uh, and if we were then to tell our, uh, tell our children and grandchildren in the coming decades what was the most profitable investment in the first 20 years of the 21st century, then uh, people would be talking about the tech industry and possibly cryptocurrencies. But once those things have had their day, of course, they might come around again in the future. But we have to look at diversification and building a strategy that works with your targets 
rather than looking at what was hot yesterday or trying to guess what might be hot tomorrow. Yeah, that's right. So diversification is a, a key and timeless point we reinforce appropriate to your risk profile and your objectives. That's something you should all consider. Uh, we need to overlay that with things like that, the risk or volatility you're comfortable taking on. You need to get that the sleep at night test balance just right. So that you're not laying awake at night, either worrying about the volatility and is my investment dropping or you're laying awake worrying and you're not getting sufficient amount of return. You need to get that balance uh, appropriate to, in terms of risk and return. We know that uh, well, I guess there's two things to it to probably mention about that. One is the difference between risk and volatility. Uh, just to clarify that, because we tend to use the words a bit interchangeably, but when you're thinking about this in terms of your investments, your pensions and your goals, I see volatility is the, the market moving up and down day to day. And it's, it's like if you own a property and you get a, a statement once a year that says your property is worth X and it's gone up or down in the last year from the prior year. It still exists. It still has value. It's worth a little more or a little less than what it was previously. And over time, it will probably and be expected to increase in value, like most diversified growth assets. Loss is loss in the real sense that you've bought an asset and the next day it ceases to exist. And that can happen if you buy a concentrated asset in a stock or, or any other particular growth asset where you have real loss. So loss from risk is different from volatility. I think that's important to understand. Diversification, meaning spreading your investments across different asset classes, types of investment, investments, geographies, currencies, uh, that can reduce that risk over time. And, and the third the third point there is time, because time is a reducer of risk and volatility. That if you uh, invest in a stock or a stock market, the theoretical likelihood of a loss over one day is something like 48%. Cumulatively over 10 years is statistically zero if you look at any five year rather than period in the last 50 years. So time does reduce your risk. And that's another important thing to think about. When you are managing your assets and you're looking towards a longer term future, keeping the focus on that time frame, we think is really important to help you to get to those goals. It helps you uh, avoid that short termism of, of what's happening today in the markets. Speaking of some of the short termism, though, David, <laughs> yes. um, one one thing that we do really need to think about, though, this year, which we haven't had to worry about in the last years, uh, is the turnaround of the dollar to the euro. And, and the reason I bring that up is actually going back to your old question or your, your, your old statement uh, from earlier in the presentation. Um, it's really important what currency you're living on. And so many of the people that are on this webinar probably have substantial amounts of cash sitting in the U.S. dollars, but it wasn't problematic for the last 14 and a half, 15 years because the dollar was going up compared to the euro. Now, all of a sudden, they might be considering that they're safe money and they might be using it towards a down payment on a house in the Netherlands or Germany or you know, just their rainy day fund. But when the dollar turns down to the euro like it's been doing the last couple of months, that becomes problematic and the differential in interest rates actually doesn't negate those losses that we're, we're, we're receiving for those currencies. So we have to remember... Risks come in many different ways, and we have to really also concentrate on the cash, not just on the stocks and as such. We can get 4 or 5% on a CD in the it States, really but if the money's identified for Europe, we need to identify it for Europe. Absolutely. And at the same time, you're, uh, you're quite right that we need to look at cash in terms of not just its, its value today, but its potential. And if we're thinking about uh, about that scenario where somebody's got a lot of money saved up in dollars, but they're going to be spending that money in euros or any other currency for that matter. There's also the function of translating it from one currency to the other. Now, the cost of foreign exchange can be huge. I've lost count of how many times I've had the conversation with clients about the fact that they've got money saved in one currency and then they go to spend it in another currency and they just transfer it by bank transfer from from one place to the other and uh, without realizing that the the transfer fee they get when they click send that might only be 15 or 20 dollars 
is just the very tip of the iceberg. That there's uh, that's what there's what's called a bid offer spread, a bid ask spread between the buying price and the selling price of any currency. So, uh, like when you're in the airport and you see the the bureau de change, where you can change your your money to the local currency, you see we buy at and we sell at. And there's a difference between those prices. Now, when you're transferring money from one currency to another through your bank or through a, an exchange office at the airport or any way, there's always that difference. Now, with your high street bank, that difference is generally between five and five and a half percent. So every time you're sending money from your US dollar account to your euro account or vice versa, you're losing 2.75% of that value. If you think back to how many times you might have done that, take 2.75% of all of that money that you've done, that you've moved by bank transfer. It's a huge amount that adds up over time. Now, this will still apply with your pension. If you're receiving a US dollar pension to a euro bank account, the bank will be translating that on the spot as it arrives. You'll be losing about 2% of your money just for the fact that you haven't had that, uh, that conscious thought about whether your cash is working towards your targets or just sitting where it is. Now, you can, of course, uh, use a broker. We encourage people to use currency brokers, and we're happy to recommend them to clients um, in order to reduce that cost, but it always needs to be involved in that financial plan. Right, and that's a really good point. So there's a number of factors that, as Brian described, as being on the cash side that can impact you outside of the core investment. Uh, currency is a, a very important one. Another important factor that we've ignored for, we've had the fortune to ignore for 20 years or so, that's come back into everyone's conversations recently is inflation. Uh, because when we're projecting ahead and we're thinking about retirement in 20 years or 25 years, if uh, you're thinking it's going to cost me 5,000 uh, euros a month to live on to have a, a really uh, comfortable retirement, and you're projecting 25 years' time, if inflation 3%, that 5,000 becomes 10,000. Because the cost of living will, at 3% inflation will double in about 25 years. So it's really important that whatever your retirement goals are, you factor inflation into that. Now, we've had this an anomalous period the last year and a half or so, where inflation got well over double digits, over, over 10%, and whilst it's coming back again now, it's still high. And all of us are seeing that at the supermarket and, and energy prices, heating your house or fueling your car if, if, you're, uh, if you're driving a car. We're seeing it costs us a whole lot more to live. That's inflation day to day. And that has something of a pernicious effect over the time that can really um, compromise your retirement goals if you don't take it into account. So that's another really important factor I think we need to be thinking about uh, beyond just the, the retirement target. Um, you know, 20 and, years ago, yeah. you, you know, 20 years ago, I, I remember giving a presentation where we were talking about to a bunch of retirees and we said, how many of you paid more for your last car than you did your first house? And everybody in the room raised their hands. And now 20 years later, I think back to the house I bought back then was $105,000. And I just looked at a car the other day that was $70,000. And it occurred to me, I'm getting to that age where I will end up paying more for a car than I did my first house. So, so thank you for pointing that out, that I'm getting to that age, David. <laughs> it's the compounding, though. Of it. <laughs> it is the compounding of that inflation that really starts to eat into, into to the overall plan. So it definitely has to be taken into account. Well, well said, David. Yeah, absolutely. If you want to work out how long it takes for you, there's a, a simple rule called the rule of 72. Uh, so you can simply uh, take number 72 and divide it by the inflation rate. And the number you come up with is how long it will take for your purchasing power to halve. So if inflation is 3%, that's 24 years. So you need to double the amount you think you need every 24 years. And that that's uh, uh, doubling on itself every 24 years. But it's somewhat exponential. So a number of important factors that we, we need to think about um, if you're US connected and you're living in Europe, it's some general factors as well as some country specific ones um, that we've covered today. It might be good to see if there's any questions from uh, the people we're speaking with now that they would like us to address. And while we're waiting for, for questions to come in, uh, there's just one other point 
that I would like to make. Uh, referring back to what we were saying earlier about uh, making sure that your your US accounts are in order and that you've updated your personal details and particularly your address and current tax residency. Um, if you contact your US institution, your bank or your investment platform, um, and you tell them, look, I, I've left the States, I'm now living in Germany or now living in the Netherlands, um, or I'm a permanent tax resident of Azerbaijan or wherever it might be. And they say to you over the phone, that's fine, just keep using your, your old address in the States because otherwise we have to close your account. Absolutely insist on getting that in writing. It's very easy for them to say that over the phone. But in that case, if it comes down the line that uh, that somebody, whether it's them or you, is being audited or prosecuted by the SEC or the IRS, it's your word against theirs as to who said what on the phone. And the IRS are always going to take the word of a regulated entity rather than an individual. And so if you're in that situation and you're contacting those institutions to update your details and they say to you, it's fine, you can keep a US forwarding address, get that in writing. If you've got it in writing for them, absolutely OK. If they won't give it to you in writing, then no, you insist that they are changing your address and make sure that they've got all of your details correct. So that's an absolute must. You must ensure that all of your details are correct and up to date with all the institutions in the States in order to protect yourself and to prevent your accounts from being frozen or, uh, or investigated. Um, and you absolutely must ensure that any advice that you're getting over the phone from an institution, if they're telling you that you don't need to change something or if they're telling you to do a specific action, you must receive that in writing. Brilliantly said. We, we've, got, we've got some questions coming in here, gentlemen. Should we, should we jump on those? Um, so we have uh, the first question. I'm uh, an American citizen that files taxes, but my husband is not. He's fully Dutch. Did I hear you say that he needs to do something as well? Okay. Um, I'll take this one if you don't mind, David. Perfect. Um, yeah. So, yes and no. As, as with everything in any conversation you'll ever have with a financial professional, the answer is going to be, it depends. Now, uh, under Dutch law, of course, you can, you can have separation of assets in different ways. So a married couple could have their assets combined from the date that they married, um, which means that anything that you had prior to your wedding is, uh, belongs to one or the other but everything that you've accumulated since then is shared. You could have complete merge of assets, whereby from the date you are, are married, everything, what's mine is yours, what's yours is mine. It's all shared 100%. Or you can have complete separation of assets, where, whereby even though you're, you're married and potentially living together, sharing a house, you have divided everything according to what's his and what's hers. Or, what belongs to each party and the two should never cross. Now, if you've got complete separation of assets, then under US law, you should be filing as separately. So one of you filing as uh, filing as married, but separate. Now, one of you would be filing as a US citizen and the other one would be declared as a non-resident alien and therefore would probably have no liability. But there should still be some element of filing there. If there's any kind of merger of your assets, if any of those assets are shared, then you should be filing together. Uh, now, I have to be very clear, we are not tax accountants. We're not regulated as accountants or tax advisors. You should always discuss this sort of thing with your accountant. So speak to your accountant who understands the Dutch system and the, and the US system and make sure that they are aware of the situation to, to understand whether you should both be filing, whether you should be filing jointly or separately, and to under, understand if there's any sort of liability. And when it comes to your investments, if you have those investments together, then yes, absolutely, both of you must make sure they are US compliant. The, the difficulty comes with uh, what David was saying earlier about when there's, a, when there's a clash between the information that one institution has and the information that another has. If the Dutch tax authorities have, have it on record that you are a couple and 
Uh, so you're getting the tax benefits of being a married couple living together with shared assets. But then the American authorities have information saying that you have separate assets and nothing is shared. Then both of them will assume that you're lying in order to fiddle the system. So the Dutch authorities will say, well, hang on, are you telling us you're a couple and you've shared your assets when you're actually not because you think you're you're going to get benefit from that? And the American, the IRS, the American authorities will think the opposite. They'll think that you're lying about having separate assets. So both of them will be coming after you wanting some extra tax or offering you a, a nice fine for your troubles. So speak with your accountant understand whether your husband needs to to be filing for us taxes uh, it may be that he just needs to to file but not pay anything um it may be that he doesn't need to file at all it may be that you need to add a few lines on your us tax returns uh, but make sure you've got that advice from your accountant make sure you understand your liabilities when it comes to your investments if your husband is only using the money that he has earned and he has saved and none of your money goes into any of his investments and those two are split down the middle, then he can continue to invest exactly the way that he has for his whole life. If any of those investments in his name or in your name are shared or are derived from both sources of income or both sources of savings, then they must absolutely be US compliant. I think that covers that one fairly thoroughly. Thank you, Ed. Right, our next question is, uh, how can a US citizen uh, and a Dutch resident open a broker account and be able to invest in ET index ETFs uh, with a couple of examples that spies of Vanguard? Um, the, our response to this, the, the specific examples, SPY and Vanguard, they're, they're a means to an end, so it doesn't really matter where or how you invest. But the short answer is that, going past the it depends that we'll give to everything because that gets frustrating for everyone listening to us, um, is that it is potentially possible that you can invest uh, into these same sort of solutions. Uh, the principle being that just because you're US connected doesn't mean you cannot invest towards your longer term goals. The, if you like, universe of approved and regulated investments that exist in the EU uh, uh, is quite broad. That shrinks considerably when you're a US connected person uh, without getting too far into those acronyms again that you may well have heard of, PFIX and all sorts of similar things that, that deem otherwise compliant investments to be inappropriate for US connected people. There are solutions that you can access that don't mean you have to be tied up in either higher cost or illiquidity and lack of flexibility. You can still access them. What is most important, though, is that those investments are indeed appropriate to your goals um, and that they help you to achieve what you're trying to achieve. But yes, you can still invest compliantly in Europe uh, as, a, as a US connected person. Yeah. Would you like to add anything to that? I mean, it does come back to what I was saying earlier about making sure that whatever solution you use says across the top of the page it's designed for US investors. And if if the structure that you're using in order to access those ETFs is not suitable for US connected individuals, then don't use it. Um, now, individual ETFs, you can have a very similar fund provided by some very broad or very different institutions. And so you might have similar funds provided by Vanguard or iShares or SPY, um, and they ultimately do a very similar thing, but they might be accessible on different platforms. So the platform that you use is going to be important. Uh, you need to make sure that the platform is US compliant and is set up for US connected individuals. And if it is, then once you've got that structure, it should only be providing you with access to ETFs or to underlying assets that are suitably compliant as well. So if you've got more questions about, about that or about anything that we've discussed today, of course, you can reach out and contact us and we'll be more than happy to, to talk to you about your individual requirements and your situation. Um, as we keep on saying, it always depends. It's uh, 
it's never one size fits all and there's never one hard and fast answer to what's going to work for you and what's going to help towards your targets so we need to make sure that we're we're operating with as much information as we can and operating in a, a designated direction looking towards your long-term future and your personal financial goals rather than just giving a, a black or white answer Gentlemen, any last thoughts before we part ways with this lovely audience? Well, I think Ed, Ed summarized those key points at the end there. I think uh, get advice that's specific to you. Don't take it from general information, even from uh, sessions like this. Get advice specific to your circumstances and focus on your objectives. As Ed said, we'd be very happy to, to talk to anyone further if they'd like uh, further support. But uh, Brian, I'd like to thank you and the team at Dunhill for uh, facilitating this uh, webinar and for giving us the chance to speak with you and to speak with the audience. It's been most enjoyable. Always wonderful to see you both. Uh, always learn something new from the two of you. So thank you so much for, for joining us today. We'll send a follow-up email that, that will include all of our past webinars as well, which includes some full sessions on taxation and so many other topics uh, mm -hmm. for the Netherlands and Germany. Um, and thank you again uh, and have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.